We're going to discuss and, and dig into this conflict along with Avelina Chakurova, director I, uh, AIES Austria. Good morning and thank you so much for joining us. Good morning and thank you very much for this uh, invitation. So first of all, we would like to kick off with this um, breaking story and the Xi Jinping Putin meeting. How do you guys perceive it and what's the message that they're trying to, to send? Do you think that Vladimir Putin is trying to find a substitute for, of course, selling his natural gas? So let me first stress that I was one uh, coining the term the dragon bear in 2014. So this relationship has been in the making for quite some time now. It is not an alliance. It's not an intent uh, in uh, Western terms. It's a modus vivendi of systemic coordination between China and Russia in various strategic domains from, of course, energy. And let me just remind you that Russia is going to capitalize on the decarbonization plan by China, which already announced that it's not going to uh, is not going to transition from uh, fossil fuels prior to 2060, which is also Russia's plan now. And that means, of course, that uh, there will be a reorientation towards Asian mar markets. Uh, China is, so to say, also seen as a uh, as a front door towards other potential Asian uh, clients. Uh, currently, the Prime Minister of Pakistan is also in Beijing, and there will be also negotiations on a gas pipeline between Russia and Pakistan. And a deal between China and Russia was sealed, or another gas pipeline will be in the making. So there will be more LNG gas uh, projects uh, in the future, uh, which of course also means that uh, at some point of time there will be kind of uh, kind of transitioning uh, towards Asian markets, where the prices are also, of course, um, uh, well. Uh, quite uh, quite uh, positive from Russian perspective. Now, what is also important is that the two uh, countries signed a joint statement on the international relations entering a new era and the global sustainable development. So the agenda is quite comprehensive. There are a lot of issues regarding the um, uh, international arena, bo both uh, sided, uh, so basically China sided with Russia on its view on Ukraine and also regarding its security concerns um, related to the re recent demands um, which were placed on the table regarding the United States and NATO. Uh, country. So in a sense, there is a lot to unpack. Uh, there will be a lot of regional, international and bilateral cooperation, which is uh, in entailed in this uh, document. And it goes from shaping the international relations, the global order, international regional organizations, and then moving to energy. So basically to the key geoeconomic spheres of influence like energy, agriculture, uh, but also the fourth uh, technological, uh, well, industrial revolution, specifically technological cooperations, artificial intelligence, space exploration, and then, as I said, uh, additional um, cooperation in new uh, areas of, uh, of um, common interest. So after this meeting, which is a clear signal that President Putin is trying to, to find a very, very strong ally in, the, uh, ally, sorry, in the face of Xi Jinping, I was wondering, do you think that there is a still possibility for, uh, how can I say, a peaceful resolution of this uh, conflict? And what are, uh, the, the, what are the conditions, in your opinion, in order to have a peaceful uh, resolution? I think that the current uh, diplomatic efforts uh, from the European states as well as uh, United States are uh, actually showing uh, kind of a shift uh, in uh, the direction of uh, diplomatic settlement. We are not there yet, of course. The danger of a military attack by Russia is in has been, in fact, permanent since 2014, since the annexation of Crimea and the direct involvement of Russia in eastern Ukraine. So this danger has been, uh, has been permanent. However, it is not imminent. And I argue that we will not witness a military attack by Russia, an incursion uh, in uh, Ukraine um, prior to February 20, because of this uh, positive 
uh, signal now coming out from Beijing because it's very important also for the Russian president to boost uh, the diplomatic uh, cloud of China, which is why I do not think that uh, uh, the Russian president would actually consider a direct military attack during the Olympic Games. And even after the Olympic Games, I think that the window for a full scale incursion is uh, in fact unrealistic. So what I expect is that in the worst case scenario, if uh, diplomatic efforts uh, really uh, fail, so to say, uh, which is not currently the case, as I said, um, they might be uh, very limited in scope and time uh, military operation, most likely in eastern Ukraine, where there are already actually networks, the separatist uh, movements are in the Donbas region, where Russia might actually uh, use uh, this uh, limited uh, limited operation to set uh, to set uh, an example, so to say, uh, with uh, the whole scenario of military escalation. Now, why do I think that we are currently in a positive um, in a positive development? is that on the one side the major economic uh, powers in Europe uh, uh, continental Europe of course uh, France Germany and Italy they have already reached out to the Russian president uh, and uh, in fact next week there will be a meeting between the French president and the Russian president there will be additional meeting uh, also in Berlin by the Normandy format uh, that means France Germany Ukraine and Russia these are all positive signs we are also awaiting of course the response to the written um, to the written letter of the United uh, States and that of course means that um, once again we uh, have to wait for uh, the for the reaction uh, by Russia I do anticipate in fact a long-term a cycle of diplomatic of um, diplomatic um, kind of uh, incentives and talks and negotiations and that will be mostly focused on the bilateral uh, side between that means bilateral track between United States and Russia whereas the European powers are not so unfortunately ge geopolitically uh, relevant uh, from a Russian point of view uh, in this um, in this whole scenario of the military escalation. So it's more about the United States. It's about upgrading the Russian position uh, in Europe, of course. It's about shaping the, the, the European security architecture. It's about setting new rules of the game. And why is it happening right now? Uh, one might ask, well, in fact, it's, uh, it's the Russian reading of the current transformation in international relations. And that is that um, America is going to uh, increasingly retreat from the old continent, moving towards the Indo-Pacific and East Asia, where the most significant economic growth is going to take place in this decade and uh, certainly in uh, the next decades, with China and India being the second and right. India being in route uh, to becoming the third economic world power. So in a sense, American retreat would mean Russia has more space to act. Uh, final take, very, very briefly, you said that, um, of course, Europe is, is not really too important from a military, military standpoint, which we can figure out. But uh, on the other side, uh, in terms of gas imports, isn't it, how can I say, the most important client of Russia? Indeed. Uh, so the European Union is still, of course, the European Union members are still, of course, the biggest uh, trade partner of Russia, without a doubt accounting for almost 40 percent. And um, well, if we look uh, at uh, the share of uh, Russia, which is uh, European Union's fifth uh, trading uh, partner, it represents only 5 percent of the European Union's total trade uh, in goods. Uh, these are the numbers from 2020 uh, and also the trade volume, volume, which is accounting for around 100. Uh, 70 to uh, 200 billion, I think that Russia is now realizing it can actually, um, well, um, increase this volume with uh, China. It already reached 140 billion last year, uh, the highest, uh, so to say, trade volume in their trade relations. And there is a lot of space now with this, uh, of course, uh, major deals that were signed. So I think that once again, this is probably a little bit of a 
of a, of a perception which uh, goes back to uh, you know to uh, the previous uh, decade which was really strong uh, for from European perspective even if we look at the as I said gas uh, in imports of course uh, uh, still russia is uh, you know is the region of uh, more than 25 percent of european union's oil imports more than 40 percent of uh, the european union's gas imports but europe is en route to uh, decarbonization europe wants to become the first uh, zero net uh, um, zero net um, emissions uh, continent and uh, russia has uh, no such plans at least in the short and uh, middle term and that of course means reconfigurations in the global um, energy portfolio so in a sense what I'm trying to imply is that there is still a lot of uh, uh, interdependence on both sides there is still also a lot of dependence among the European Union members so not all member states are equally equally dependent we have serious problems uh, because some of the key European members such as Germany have strong economic interests uh, uh, right. in Russia and that of course is going to shape the future of the relationship uh, but uh, there will be a lot of reshuffle and we should be aware of it and in case of a war not only the gas imports but also the food prices will actually skyrocket so it's not only about the energy side of this uh, of this of a possible war it's also the agriculture side and given that the food prices have been already on the rise reaching the high already in 2021, 20, uh, uh, similar to the 2011 uh, uh, situation. We should not for, uh, forget that it's not only about the European powers that are not interested in a war between right. Ukraine and Russia, but it's actually an international issue meanwhile. Thank you very much, Velina Chakurova, Director AIES Austria. Thank you for joining us. Have a great day and have a great weekend, of course. Thank you very much for the invitation.